It's great to see you. I'm really have to tell you before I get into the word tonight, I'm just so excited about these next few months uh, that we'll be in this series for a few months. And I do believe uh, it's a sweet spot for me. Uh, I'm being reminded to relay some foundations that we've done before in uh, past years. Uh, some of the things we'll be sharing go back a few years, but uh, there's always something new in the Lord. It's like God never, uh, Lizzie used to say when I'm, she'd see me agonizing, okay, Lord, I just want to hear you. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want me to say? What do you want me to teach? And she said, why don't you just pull an old message out of the files? You know, you got, I have preached like 5,000 messages. I'm not kidding. That's not an exaggeration. And I have them all. I have all the notes and everything. But there's just something. I mean, when I pull them out, I look at them and say, no, I can do this better. And, uh, but I fail <laughs> sometimes. But I'm very excited about this. And we'll continue with our series on total truth, recovering a comprehensive Christianity. We've lost something. We've lost something as God's people. Gary DeMar said that over time, Christianity has ceased to be a comprehensive, world-changing religion. The bad news is that though we've lost something, we can get it back. Christians can recover a comprehensive Christianity by building a biblical worldview that sees every area of life through the lens of Scripture. So with that in mind, I'd like to do part two of the thought we led with last week, how to build a biblical worldview. How to build a biblical worldview. In part one, we considered three questions. What is a worldview? What's a biblical worldview? And then... How can we begin to build it? Uh, this well-run website, gotquestions.org, which I find very helpful, gives a very succinct definition of a worldview as that which refers to a comprehensive conception of the world from a specific standpoint. A biblical worldview, then, is a comprehensive conception of the world from a Christian standpoint. Now, when I use the term biblical worldview, that's coterminous with Christian worldview, just so you know. We could say a Christian worldview is a comprehensive conception of the world from a biblical standpoint. Either way you go, we're saying the, making the same point. So once we know what a worldview is and what a biblical worldview is, then we obviously need to get deeper into the question of how do we build a biblical worldview. I have two points for you tonight. The second point we will be expanding for a few months. And my prayer has been this week that you would take uh, some of the things we will say in the second point and just let them sink into your heart and your spirit because it will change. It will change you. Uh, it'll transform your minds uh, in a powerful way. But where do we begin? The first point, begin is the operative word, you know, because sometimes people will hear, that's what I want. I want a biblical worldview. I realize I already have a worldview. Everyone has one, but I know I have one that's not quite what it should be. How do I begin? And uh, the Methodist theologian William Abraham says, your first step in developing and using a Christian worldview is to realize the words of Jesus in John 17, 17, where he said to his father, thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. In other words, we begin to build a biblical worldview when we embrace the Bible as the final, ultimate truth about all it addresses. 
and it addresses everything. In her book, Total Truth, Nancy Piercy says that we must insist on presenting Christianity as a comprehensive, unified worldview that addresses all of life and reality. It's not just religious truth, it is total truth. Building a biblical worldview changes the way we think. It's actually the fulfillment, as we said recently, of the great commandment to love God with all of our mind. Jesus said, love God with all your heart and soul and mind. One writer referred to it as thinking Christianly. Piercy says, thinking Christianly means understanding that Christianity gives the truth about the whole of reality a perspective for interpreting every subject matter. Everyone has a worldview, but the biblical worldview is superior, as we will show you, to all other worldviews because it is the only worldview that originates in the mind of God, not the mind of man. We have to humble ourselves, in a sense, when we come before the Word of God, not ever take it for granted, realizing that God is giving us and revealing His mind, how He thinks about things. He told the prophet Isaiah in 55 verses 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my way, your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The truth is God is so much higher and greater than we are that we could never know the mind of God without the Word of God, without His gracious revelation. This is why we must go to God in the beginning of our search for true knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You know, everyone that's got a brain wants knowledge. That's why we go to school, why we read. The main thing a parent wants to do with their newborn baby is to begin to impart knowledge. The Bible says that the beginning of knowledge, where you begin, is the fear of the Lord. Now, the fear of the Lord does not mean that we dread the Lord or that we fear He is seeking to harm us. Adam Clark said, the fear of the Lord signifies that religious reverence which every intelligent being owes to his creator. The great Puritan Matthew Henry reminds us that the fearful reverence for God and his word is where the biblical worldview begins. And we said, we, in the attaining of knowledge, this is most necessary, that we fear God. We are not qualified to profit by the instructions that we're given unless our minds are possessed with a holy reverence for God and every thought within us be brought into obedience to Him. In the same way, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the Bible also says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Albert Barnes says the beginning of wisdom is found in an attitude of reverence and awe of God. The fear of the finite, which is us, in the presence of the infinite, which is God of the sinful in the presence of the holy. This fear has no torment. It compares with childlike love. 
but it says it is fear, not love, that is the beginning of wisdom. And so we see the Bible says both knowledge and wisdom begin with the fear of the Lord. The God Questions website reminds us that though biblical, but though knowledge and wisdom begin with the fear of the Lord, God is not repeating himself. There is a difference. Wisdom and knowledge are related, but they're not the same. Knowledge is information gained. Wisdom is the ability to judge what is true or right. This is powerful. Knowledge can exist without wisdom. How many of you know people that know a lot? But they have no wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to judge what is true or right. Knowledge can exist without wisdom, but not the other way around. One can have knowledge without being wise. Knowledge is knowing how to use a gun. Wisdom is knowing when to use it and when to keep it in the holster. So building a biblical worldview with wisdom and knowledge begins with the fear of the Lord and finds its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God. That's his name. That's who he is. That's why the Apostle Paul tells us something you've probably read. Have you thought about it? He said, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All wisdom and knowledge is hidden in Christ, who is the very Word of God. And it's all wisdom and knowledge, and I keep saying this because it's important, because we limit God sometimes, not just religious knowledge. When we don't know what we need to know or how to think about something, God graciously gives us permission to ask. In James chapter 1, verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. If you want to know something, if you want to have wisdom about interpreting your life, or what's going on in the culture. We can ask God, but there's a stipulation because many people ask God for wisdom, but they don't get anything. He says, the reason is you must ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from God. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Notice, that's so critical. Remember, worldviews primarily have to do with how we think with our minds. So a, a doubting person has a double mind. If, we have, if we're double-minded about things, and I will, I'm trying to restrain myself because this is the snare of so many of God's people. They want knowledge and wisdom, but they're double-minded. I've had decades of debates with good people who go to church and love God, and they're on their way to heaven. But they believe in evolution. They just assume, since it's taught in the schools, and it's in the textbooks, and it's commonly accepted in the culture, and yet the Bible tells us that God created all things. Things don't just evolve. They were created by a designer. And when... when I'm going to move on, but I'm going to make this point. For example, any Christian 
that tries to obtain a biblical worldview and looks to the Word of God for knowledge and wisdom and still tries to believe in evolution is a double-minded person. And that alone explains why people don't grow in their journey with the Lord. You see them 20 years later and they're still confused, tossed about like waves. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Can't accommodate that to the worldview of the culture that accepts evolution and the poor Christians who try to marry the two. That's double-minded. Genesis 1.28, God created them male and female. It breaks my heart to see pastors, churches, denominations trying to accommodate the cultural view now, the new views about gender. You're double-minded. You won't receive anything from God. You're ineffective. You're unstable in all your ways. Or John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And yet millions of Christians, I, think, I don't think I'm exaggerating, millions of American Christians believe that there are many ways to God. Churchgoers, some pastors. I think I've made my point. If you doubt these revelations, this is, the, this is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom. If you need it, ask God. He'll give it to you through his word. But if you, if you, are, if you doubt that his word is true, not just true, but it's totally true. So let me just quickly sum up point one, because I'm going to move on to something very important, which will launch us into the rest of the series coming up. How to build a biblical worldview, you begin with realizing that God's Word is truth. Not a truth, it is truth. That the fear of the Lord, respect and reverence for Him and who He is, is the beginning of all knowledge, all wisdom, and understanding. And God gives us all the wisdom we ask for if we don't doubt what He gives us. William Abraham said, what a gift you have as a believer. The rest of humanity gropes in the dark for answers about the most basic questions of life, and you have them all bound up in one book, the Bible. Powerful. So that's where you begin. Biblical worldview begins with the Word. But my second point, dive a little deeper. Worldviews are how a person answers the great questions of life. So how does the biblical worldview answer the great questions of life? And I believe What I'm going to share with you, if you can even, if, if you could just, they're very easy to remember, but if you need to write them down, write them down. Because I, I, I try to boil things down and make them simple. There are three great questions of life. Three, what we call presuppositions that you must have to build a biblical worldview. As I said, everyone has a worldview, whether they're aware of it or not, a way of thinking about human existence and answering these questions.
one of the questions, what's it all about? That's a good question. But it's not one of the three. I want to suggest that if we can nail down the biblical worldview on these three questions, creation, fall, redemption. If we can get grounded in those three, creation, and you could ask this many ways, but the basic question is, has to do with how did we get here? Where did it all come from? You have to be completely grounded in that concept, scriptural concept of creation. The fall is the biblical worldview of, that answers the question, what's gone wrong? I mean, once you, once you, under, once you know where you, we came from, and if you read the Bible, it says everything God made was good, but what's, what's gone wrong? And redemption is how can it be made right? Creation, God made all things good, but Adam fell. He sinned. And all things went bad. Redemption in Christ will make all things right. I like to, if you could think of this, and, and this is very powerful. It's like a three-act play. Creation, Genesis 1, chapters 1 and 2, really, the fall, Genesis 3, and redemption, which is prophesied in Genesis 3, fulfilled by Christ in the New Testament, and fully consummated at the end of the book in Revelation 22. Genesis 1 and 2. I've got a, not a large Bible here, but in Genesis 1 and 2, that's uh, in this Bible, that's two pages. Cool. In the fall is described in Genesis 3. And then in Genesis 3, redemption is prophesied as to come through the seed of the woman. And that doesn't happen until over here in the Gospels. And the fulfillment of the total redemption, which we're going to be talking about, the comprehensive redemption. How many of you know the fall was comprehensive? Then redemption in Christ will be comprehensive. And very, very, you'll be surprised how few understand that. Some people think only a part of the creation will be redeemed. But over in Revelation 22, 21 and 22, which in this Bible is like four pages, what I'm saying is between creation and the full redemption is the story. Most of the Bible deals with redemption. It's the, it's the tale, the story, the epic, the saga of how God will set all things right. Creation, fall, redemption. Albert Walters, professor of religion at Redeemer University in Canada, says a biblical worldview involves three fundamental dimensions. The original good creation, the perversion of that creation through sin, and the restoration of that creation in Christ. Got that? That's important. 
Actually, it's fundamental, as he says. Fundamental means that which forms a necessary base or core, that which is of central importance. Those three questions, creation, where do we come from? The fall, what's gone wrong in the world? And redemption, how can it be fixed? Those are the foundational fundamentals that's such a key point. If we get right on those three things, we have a basis to build the rest of the worldview on. Nancy Piercy says the grid, she calls it a grid, of creation, fall, redemption provides the scaffolding for constructing a Christian perspective on any topic, along with a grid for analyzing competing worldviews. This is the beauty of having a biblical worldview on creation, fall, redemption. It not only gives the individual believer the Christian perspective on any other topic, it also helps us to understand the worldviews of others. Piercy says a simple and effective means of comparing worldviews is to apply the grid of creation, fall, and redemption. Let me go ahead and, because I want to make sure this, this we can't miss. Creation refers to ultimate origins, ultimate origins. Every worldview or philosophy has to start with a theory of origins. Where did it all come from? Who are we and how did we get here? The biblical worldview could easily say that the first verse in the Bible is the most important verse in the Bible, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the basic presupposition. Some people, somebody said, we'll talk about the cross. This is what we do. We jump ahead to the redemption, and we lay no foundation about the creation and the fall. And what you end up with is converts who have no worldview beyond personal salvation. This is all about getting saved. The cross is the message. The cross is central. We totally agree to be saved, getting people saved, that's, that's essential, but it doesn't stop there. If we jump ahead to the end and we don't have, we don't, you won't, you can't have a comprehensive biblical worldview if you're just over here at the end. Ronald Nash says at the center of every worldview, every worldview is what might be called the touchstone proposition of that worldview. A proposition that is held to be fundamental truth about reality and serves as a criterion to determine which other propositions may or may not count as candidates for belief. If the creation account is true. If God, in the beginning, created the heavens and the earth, if that's true, we have a foundation for believing everything else that's in the entire Bible. I've had people want to argue about the virgin birth. And I, I, I learned a good thing to ask him. Just, just say, stop. Do you believe in a created universe? No. Well, why do you want to argue with someone about a virgin birth when they don't even accept the fundamental basic proposition of the entire Bible, which is Genesis 1-1? On the other hand, if 
Genesis 1-1 is true, and there is a being that was that existed before the beginning. Because the Bible says, in the beginning, God created, which implies God was there before the beginning. But what was before the beginning? Eternity. Beginning is a time word. That's why it says, that's what God is telling us right in the first verse. Okay, we're going to talk about time and space, time and history. Later, the Bible does what I like. Movies have flashbacks. Later, the Bible shows stories and things like the fall of Lucifer that occurred before the beginning. We know Lucifer fell before Genesis 1-1 because in the creation, when he created Adam and Eve, he said, guard the garden, meaning there's an enemy. All right. Hang in there, folks. Everybody okay? <laughs> it is the biblical worldview of creation that not only equips the Christian with faith in God, but enables the believer to analyze other worldviews according to how they answer that question. For example, the atheist believes or claims there is no God. So the number one building block of the biblical worldview, you either believe it or you don't. But you can't have a biblical worldview without that. When I talk to people, and, and I'm, I'm not great at it, I mean, I'm trying to get better. I want to hear what they're saying so that I can discern where they're coming from. Because it's not just enough to debate somebody about a particular issue. You want to try to discern and judge where are they coming from. And many times, if you just ask them that question, like Dennis Peacock used to teach us, that just ask people, do you believe in a created universe? And if they say no, you know right away you're going to have a harder time not to say there aren't people who believe in a created universe who don't believe the truth about the fall and the redemption, but I'm saying that's the, that's the starting point. And God said over and over, I think it was like 10 times in the, during the creation story, and God saw every, what he made, and it was very good. It was very good. It was very good. And then at the end of the story, at the end of chapter 2, it says, and God saw everything he made, and it was very good. So everything God made, including the man and the woman, was very good. This is, this is again, when you hear the Gnostics or the, the modern neo-Gnostics say, well, spirit is good and the material is evil. Well, that's not true. There is nothing in God's creation that was inherently evil when he created it. It was all good. Well, the spirit is good, the flesh is bad. The flesh is evil. It's inherently wicked. That's not true. God made man and woman in flesh and said it was very good. If the flesh is evil, how come the Son of God was willing to be born in the flesh? But something happened. What was it? The fall. Every worldview offers a counterpart to the fall. An explanation of the source of evil and suffering. This is a big one I run into. Yeah, just people, anybody that says, are you religious to you? What? If there is a God, your God is God and he's good. How come there's so much evil? Why is, does he allow so much evil? Can he stop it? If he doesn't want it and can't stop it, he can't be all-powerful. If he doesn't want it and lets it happen anyway, he can't be loved. And this is a big one. And a lot of Christians just kind of scratch their heads, don't know how to answer it. 
But the biblical worldview is that human sin is the source of all the evil and suffering that is in the world and that has ever been in the world. Now, you can turn on the TV today and you'll hear a politician say, well, here's what's really wrong. It's the rich get rich and the poor get poor. What's really wrong with the world is income inequity. So the solution is redistribute wealth. That's, that's how we fix it. That is a worldview speaking. Do you understand what I'm saying? That is a worldview. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't secondary issues, but the root of all the suffering and evil in the world is sin that came in the fall of our first parents in the Garden of Eden. Redemption. Finally, to engage people's hearts, every worldview has to instill hope by offering some vision of redemption, some agenda for reversing the fall and setting the world right again. This is what I was saying. When you hear people's analysis of what's wrong in the world, then you must use your biblical worldview to, to recognize where they're coming from. We got a problem with the southern border. It's a problem. And it's, it's a real problem. But I'm telling you, the root of it is sin. We got the problem at the southern border because somebody is sinning. Somebody who is making the decisions that's allowing it is sinning or they have a motive for allowing it and promoting it to happen that is sinful. That's why I say it, it's like uh, it's like wiping away a cobweb. Well, what we need to do is we got a cobweb here in the house. We need to get rid of it. So we wipe it away. Next day it's back. Wipe it away. The solution is kill the spider. Hallelujah. Kill a spider. Go to the root. See, most, most people think uh, in this divided way, sacred, secular, spiritual, physical. And they don't see the comprehensive picture of God's creation that is ruled by him in total truth when we have these issues develop. The evolutionist believes man will eventually save himself when he's highly enough evolved. You know, it's like somebody said, you, you send your children to the government schools where they're taught they come from animals and then you're surprised when they come home and act like animals. Well, where does that whole thing come from? Darwin hated God. I mean, his mission in life was to create a system of belief, a theory that eliminated the need of a creator God, a designer who made everything according to a purpose. Because in evolution, there's no purpose. It just evolves. It just, your eyeball sees because it evolved. Can you imagine how stupid that is that you could take a, you could take a something floating on the ocean and wait millions of years and it'll develop into a full grown human being with an eye that has like a million parts that sees and a brain that interprets what it sees. I mean, it's, it's, that's why the biblical worldview is, is so superior and yet we don't defend it. We don't even speak it. 
because we we can we could take out any other worldview, any other cultural conflict can be won if we have the right worldview. And as we go forward, we'll be continuing to show you because the implications of this are greater than you think. I'm not just asking you to to remember that the foundational uh, questions, the biblical worldview answers are creation, fall, redemption, because when you we get into it deeper, you'll be amazed at some of the places maybe in your own worldview where, where you, you could use some instruction. And I'm not speaking as one who's arrived. I learned a long time ago, I'm not going to arrive. It's all about the journey. All right. What have we said tonight? We made two points. How do we begin to build a biblical worldview? And it begins with that word of God, the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of understanding. That's where you begin. And the second point we, we got into was how do we use that worldview to answer the three great questions of life? Everything begins with this, this wholehearted, single-minded commitment to God's word as the source of all wisdom and knowledge and the treasures that are hidden in Christ Jesus. That is fundamental. You know, years ago, I remember when we were first saved, there were things that were said often in the meetings uh, one of the things, some of you may remember this, if you're an old time, where people would say, God said it. Uh, <laughs> that settles it. I believe it. Yeah. That was a, but that really was a, that's where it starts. He said, if God said it, I believe it. You say, I, do I understand it? You don't have to understand it. I do not understand all about God. He is infinite. My mind is finite. No one can fully know infinity who has a beginning. And we all have a beginning. God had no beginning. He, his greatness is unsearchable. But so whatever we learn is, is, is we learn a part but it's, it, it will sustain us. And if you were, if you were with us back, back when we had the, the ministry over at Bethel, I mean, how many times did I say, use the, because John Osteen was one of my heroes, not Joel Osteen, his father. And he would declare, get the, get the people. In those days, people brought their Bibles. See, we spoil you. We put all the scriptures up. I remember the day when you hear a sermon and the, the pastor would say, okay, let's everybody look up Psalm 24, 3, and everybody, he'd have to wait and everybody would look it up. Well, see, we spoil you, but it, people brought a Bible. And he said, hold up your Bible and say this, this is my Bible. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I believe it is the everlasting Word of God, the true Word of God. I will be fed the Word of God, and it will change me. I will never, ever, ever be the same. And we would say that before every sermon. I learned that from John Osteen. Now that I understand a little more about biblical worldviews, I believe that's what he was saying. This is where I find out who I am, who the world is, how the world works, how the other people think, what the positions are, where they're coming from. And that is a, that's a wonderful thing. To me, it's the most exciting thing in the world. So let me just close with something I love. This Presbyterian a minister, Edwin Ryan, said, Christianity is a world and life view and not simply a series of unrelated doctrines. Christianity includes all of life, every realm of knowledge, every aspect of life, and every facet of the universe find their place and their answer within 
Christianity. It is a system of truth enveloping the entire world in its grasp. That's what we're after. And I'll have to say, I believe that the greatest shortcoming in the American church of those of us who preach and teach the Word of God is our failure to equip God's people with a biblical worldview. And with God helping us, we're going to change that. Amen. Father, we thank you for the revelation. You didn't have to give it to us, but you chose to reveal your mind to us so that we could think your thoughts after you. That we could learn to think Christianly about all things. Lord, tonight, in the days to come, I pray, Lord, that we will have a greater understanding and that your people in this nation will have an infusion of divine inspiration as we all begin to realize how we have limited the Holy One of Israel. We've compartmentalized the truth to the private realm, to the religious realm, and fail to apply your word to every situation of life. I'm asking you for that kind of a revival, not just a revival of the spirit, but a revival of the mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.